Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Welcome to today's program, and our topic is higher education in America today. And Americans in all the polls uh, indicate that this is one of the most important topics uh, that we have, including K-12. We're de very delighted to welcome to our program someone highly qualified to discuss this subject. And we also want to introduce to our audience the new president of North Idaho College, Dr. Priscilla Bell. Uh, she comes to us with a very distinguished education background and certainly qualifies her as an expert in the field. Our guest received her doctorate in education administration from the University of Texas in Austin. She also holds a master's degree in counseling from California State University in Los Angeles, and her baccalaureate degree is in psychology from Texas Tech University. As to her professional career, in addition to now serving as president of our college uh, from 2000 to 2006, she served as president of Highland, Highline Community College in Des Moines, Washington. Prior to that, from 1995 to 2000, she served as president of the Fulton Montgomery Community College in Johnsontown, New York, in Upper State, New York. And for 17 years, she served in several capacities at Tacoma Community College. Uh, Dr. Bell, welcome to the program, and you certainly come with great credentials. Thank you, Tony. It is really a pleasure to join you today. And I do want to add a footnote. In our 36 years of doing this program, we've had the opportunity to introduce to our audience all the six presidents of North Carolina <laughs> College during that period of time, including two interns, and it certainly is your turn, and we appreciate it. Our panelist today is Erna Reinhardt, Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College, and she will come in today's questioning. Thank you, Tony. And Dr. Bell, welcome to the show. And Thanks, Erna. We are delighted to have you here as our president at North Idaho College. My first question today is um, to give you an opportunity to share with our viewers, discuss a little bit the differences between community colleges, colleges, and universities. In, in the United States, we have a lot of community colleges, and we have four-year schools. So. Tell us how community colleges are different than four-year schools. I think the major difference that you find between community colleges and the, the four-year universities and colleges is our mission, our comprehensive mission, and our open-door, access, accessible uh, philosophy. Um, first of all, the mission for community colleges incorporates at least four different areas. Certainly doing the first two years of the baccalaureate degree is a major part of our mission, our academic transfer mission. But we also focus on providing um, certificate and degree programs which qualify students to go immediately into the workforce. In addition to that, we are strong in non-credit and community service programming, and we have a major role in adult basic education and developmental education. Those four mission areas across all community colleges. Then you add to that our open door philosophy. Everyone is welcome, regardless of their background. We help to prepare them to succeed. And our affordability, then you see that we are opening the door to millions of students across the nation. The other thing I would say is that community colleges are usually the focal point of the community. And that's very important. You don't always find that with colleges and universities. And we focus on teaching and learning, small classes, personal attention. Excellent. Well said about community colleges. Uh, that leads to my question, too, because it has a connection. As the world has become what I would describe almost as a global village, you know, with technology and, and travel, how is this trend changing what we do in the whole field of higher education? It is changing what we do in the world of higher education from the kinds of students that we see to the educational mm -hmm. programs that we offer to our role in the world. Um, for one thing, no matter how mo homogenous the community might be in, in which the college sits, we have to educate our students to be good citizens of the world and to be able to work mm -hmm. in the world. That means they have to know about, understand, and be able to move in many different cultures. Knowing a foreign language is more important today mm -hmm. than it ever was. You have to be comfortable with travel. You have to be comfortable connecting to the world via the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, it also suggests that colleges need to be bringing students in to their, the environment that come from other cultures and other countries so that our students, even if they can't travel abroad, 
have the opportunity to experience firsthand different cultures, different traditions. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. President Bell, there are a lot of issues facing higher education today. Some of them are how can we better partner with businesses? How can we better partner with K through 12? The whole issue about federal financial aid. Share with us some of your um, thoughts on what are what is the greatest need or what is the greatest issue facing higher ed today? You know, I'm not going to mention any of those specifics that you just mentioned, though all are very, very important. I think the challenge for higher education right now is figuring out a way to be innovative, flexible, and dynamic in this fast-changing world. Higher education institutions are kind of by nature hidebound. Even community colleges, and, and we're renowned for our flexibility and you know fast-moving approach to meeting the needs of the community, but even we are slow by today's standards. So I think that's going to be the chief challenge among us, uh, before us. It's so interesting, getting ready for this program, I was talking to some of our people who are involved with our technology, um, such as Dr. Wheeler and others. Mm -hmm. And due to this modern technology, the world has changed so much you know, in what, how you teach classes. And there's such a growing um, experience with internet classes, and distance learning classes. And, Today, she was sharing with me some other things and what we're, some of our faculty, and like other schools, are doing with that technology, not on just lecturing the classroom, but what's available on the iPod, etc. So based on this long introduction to this, and, and NIC, our college is really out front in this area. Yes, we are. Uh, how does this affect students? Much? In other words, we're receiving a student today that's much different. I was working with a group of students with this television in the second grade, and they were on computers. Yeah. So how do we meet the needs of this really more sophisticated student with the technology? You know, one of the um, aspects of community colleges that I didn't mention in, in response to your first question it has to do with the diversity in our student population, just in terms of age. Right. We serve um, many students who aren't sophisticated when it comes to technology, who are kind of like me. Uh, used to sitting in the classroom and having someone teach to them. But our growing number of students are very well versed in technology and, and are not satisfied to mm -hmm. just sit in a chair and be spoken to. They need to be engaged, um, they need to be active, and they appreciate and actually demand many different kinds of instructional modes. Um, they're also <coughs> more focused on instruction being given when they want it and where they want it, and in fact, how they want it. Oh, they demand it, don't they? They, they do. They're much more focused on themselves as customers than as students. And that is something that we have to pay attention to because if we don't keep their, if we don't keep their attention by paying attention to that, then we run the risk of losing students to boredom, and that means they won't be successful. Or they'll go to another institution. That's right. <laughs> I do have a follow-up just because I'll notice how that coin, you know, social interaction is so important. And at this institution, we have been really fortunate. We have great music and great drama, and we have lecture series and all that. But more and more students are able not to come to a college campus, and they get their courses on the Internet or whatever. Uh, Dr. Bell, how do we... <coughs> encourage them, to, you know, they need those courses, but how do we encourage them to do something or do we make certain requirements, a certain amount on campus for social interaction? And I think there's encouragement that can happen. Um, hybrid courses are, are, by the way, a great answer to this particular dilemma because in hybrid courses, a student takes part of the course online mm -hmm. but also comes to campus for on-campus instruction mm -hmm. and that social interaction. Um, so that's a part of the answer. But there are students who want to do their full degree mm -hmm. online, and I think we have to offer the opportunity for those students to do that. Um, you know, there, there are ways to encourage them to get out um, for internships, for example, mm -hmm. and into other kind of settings where they are with people, but not necessarily on the college campus as they interact with the subject matter. One of the things we do here that we're, um, I know that the interim vice president instruction are very big on is service learning. That's mm -hmm. another example. Erna Reinhardt. One of the trends that we're seeing happening in our country today is that some states, such as Florida, 
is requiring or requesting that their high school students declare a major before they go to college. So one of our questions that we have for you today was, what, what do you think of that? I'm not um, impressed with that trend, if indeed it is a trend. I'm not positive that it is yet. I think we have an obligation as educators to provide an environment where students have the opportunity to learn about many different things, where they have the opportunity to be broadly educated. Forcing students to choose a major before they even go to college narrows them unnecessarily into one track. And though we may not have very many Renaissance men anymore, mm -hmm. um, I still think that's a worthy goal. And I'm afraid that we are really forcing students to choose highly restricted paths when we force them into an early major. We have so many students, this is a comment, there's so many students that come to us that have, that don't know what their major is. They don't really know what they, what they do. And I think one of the greatest services that we have here at our college that you see at a lot of other colleges are career centers mm -hmm. where students can, students and people in the community can come to our career center and there is a multitude of resources there where they can explore, um, take assessments, any of those things to try mm -hmm. to help them figure out what it is that they want to pursue. Yes, and that is a very, very good resource. Um, you know, the other thing I think we need to recognize in today's very fast-changing world and global economy, generally people don't stay in one job or one career yeah. for a long time. And that is the other downside of channeling students <coughs> into a major very early. They do not have the preparation to make career switches as easily as someone who's been more broadly educated. And, and we're seeing that too in the, the variance in age of, of students. And I saw a statistic recently that some people, or quite a lot of people, changed jobs four or five times in yeah. career. That used not to be true. And so we have to be spiteful of that. Something that I'm very, very interested in, and I, and I know today we're taking this show, you're going to be helping at the Human Rights Center. And that's something that's also really, really dear to my heart is human rights, civil rights, mm -hmm. and diversity. And by the way, when you were interviewed for this position, and we had the opportunity as a faculty to ask that question, you really have a comprehensive understanding of the difference between civil rights, human rights, and the whole issue of diversity. So that leads me to my question. Some institutions, this is more true than others uh, in larger urban settings. You've certainly spent a lot of time, like in the Seattle area. But as our country becomes more diverse, we're not too far away from a time when the fighting with Saxons of our country will be the largest group, but not a majority. It'll be a plurality. Mm -hmm. So the diversity in color is just really major, and it's, we are really a enriched, diverse population. Based on that, Dr. Bell, not only at this institution, but all institutions, and you travel and you, you, you serve on a number of national committees for community colleges, um, what must we do that we're not doing to recognize this incredible change in demographics? And the demographics are changing everywhere. Yes. We may um, live in a fairly homogenous community here in North Idaho, but our students aren't necessarily going to stay in that this world. It is incumbent on us to reach out through recruitment of students and recruitment of faculty and staff to build the diversity, the ethnic diversity, among other kinds of diversity, on our campus. That's, that's one thing that we have to do, and we need to start doing it early. Um, we can't wait till someone is 18 years old. We need to start working with our schools and students and parents in the schools to prepare students for a college um, experience. That way we have a better hope of building the diversity of our classes and assuring that people from all backgrounds have the opportunity to become educated. The other thing I believe is important is to look at our programming, our, our instructional mm -hmm. programming and our extracurricular pro programming or co-curricular programming so that we're confident that our, our instructional programs as well as those programs outside the classroom um, reflect the world that we're in, not just a segment of the world. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have a variety of classes that give students experiences and the knowledge they need in this changing global world. You have the advantage of traveling a lot and meeting with other educators and other presidents. And you've had, as I introduced you, you've got a rich background at a lot of colleges. 
uh, and, and also a lot of degrees. One thing that disturbs me is in recent reports that some of our most prestigious schools in this country, like the Ivy League school, this is kind of follow up on this question, uh, the students on campus, African American students, Native American, Hispanic, Latino, everyone, they segregate themselves within the university. Uh, they tend to create clubs, organizations, and so this report was saying there's segregation within the university. Mm -hmm. With your colleagues, you're talking about what is being done to try to encourage cross understanding of cultures, which is a great opportunity while you're on the college campus as a student. Yes, and that's one of the things that, that has proven to be difficult, not just with students of color mm -hmm. or different ethnic groups on campus, resident students, I mean, um, those who live in the right. community, but with international students right. who also tend to self-segregate. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very conscious in, especially mm -hmm. our um, instructional programming, what we do in the classroom, that we create an atmosphere where students are expected to work together, mm -hmm. where we create study groups, project teams, that get people from different backgrounds and of different interests working together towards a common goal. Our extracurricular and co-curricular programming can also be useful in that, mm -hmm. in that arena because um, with well-structured, innovative approaches, you find that you can bring in um, the Latinos, the African Americans, the Na Native Americans, the Caucasians mm -hmm. into um, interest groups and friendships form, and that's very important. In all studies I've seen in, in our work in human rights, the greatest way to combat uh, prejudice and bigotry is knowing one another. Yeah. And that when they get to do that, then a lot of those uh, change and they get to appreciate mm -hmm. people who are different. And the stereotypes are busted. Yes, exactly. Erna Reinhardt. One of the major challenges, I, I think, in colleges and universities today, Dr. Bell, is is maintaining quality and skilled employees and it's those employees that are also such a big part of of success in any kind of business or <coughs> higher education institution and the competition for those employees becomes greater and greater and greater especially in fields like nursing and other fields so <coughs> share with us how that is going to impact the future of colleges and universities we are, I'm afraid, seeing the retirement of people my age. <laughs> the baby boomers, we're, we're getting there. And several of us in that category. I know, several <laughs> of us are. Um, and unfortunately, in the community college world, it's a little bit more of a drastic situation, if you will, than the universities because the community college movement really started um, across the United States in the late 60s and early 70s, and the vast majority of people who were, vast majority, that may be an exaggeration, but many, many people who are currently working in community colleges today as faculty, administrators, staff, were hired back then and they're ready to retire. So we're going to see a lot of our, our workforce going away in the next five <laughs> years. How do we replace them? The pipeline doesn't seem to be there. One thing is we have to start working on growing our own we need leadership programs within the college, within the state, in the na nation, where we can send people to develop strong leadership skills, um, good teaching skills, and really interest them in moving from one level to another. That's one thing. We can also do more recruiting for faculty and staff. Um, one of the programs I'm familiar with from Washington is a internship program which targets people in their master's program, you know, people in the university in their master's program, brings them into the college um, to be mentored by a faculty member and do teaching. And this often really hooks them. And so that's that's a great that's a great program. It's gonna be a challenge. No one person has the answer, at least not that I've seen. <laughs> Some of these things are <coughs> so global they, they overwhelm us all. Mine is a follow-up of Ernest's question, and I have sympathy for administrators and boards having to deal with limited resources, i.e. money. But w one of the growing trends in the country, particularly for community colleges, less the universities because of the requirements they have for teaching and faculty, you have a growth in the population of the student body. 
but you have X dollars that will hire a certain number of full-time faculty. And either you turn students away or you hire an adjunct faculty to teach one or two courses. And I don't want to be misunderstood. They're really high-quality adjunct faculty. It's not in any way derogatory towards them. But the problem is twofold, I think, and then I get your response. At North Carolina College, we're in much better shape. We're about a 70-30 ratio in, in, in faculty full-time. In our neighboring state of Washington, in many of the colleges, over 60% adjunct faculty. I saw one school where it was 80%. My long involvement with this question, I see two problems that I'd like for you to respond to. The first one is, and, and I've used a very harsh term, this thing around America, we're creating sweatshops, meaning that those wonderful adjunct faculty are getting such a limited amount of money, they don't have any fringe benefits, and some of them are teaching at two or three different schools. That's the first problem. Uh, and the second problem, I think, is if you don't have a lot of full-time faculty on campus each day, the students are there, and they don't have that opportunity to be with faculty, and mentoring is so important, and adjunct faculty have to leave and do something else. So that's my very complex question. You, again, with your colleagues, how are you wrestling with this problem? You know, Tony, adjunct faculty are crucial to any community college. Um, and to any university or four-year college because they bring needed flexibility and they bring, in many, in many instances, the diversity that we're, that we're looking for. Um, some colleges, the University of Phoenix is an example, rely almost solely on part-time faculty. It is, they have a different kind of mission and that works for them. So you have to take mission into consideration as well. But one of the things I think we have to recognize is that in terms of a college's flexibility to offer needed programs, sometimes the only way to test drive the programs 